This is Unsung History, the podcast where we tell the stories of people and events in American history that haven't gotten much notice. I'm your host, Kelly Therese Pollack. I'll start each episode with a brief introduction to the topic and then interview someone who knows a lot more than I do. Today's story is about migrant incarceration and solidarity in the Imperial Valley of California. In 1945, United States immigration officials opened the El Centro Immigration Detention Camp in El Centro, California. The structures used in the construction of the camp had been repurposed from Fort Stanton Internment Camp in New Mexico, which had been used during World War II to house captured German crewmen and briefly Japanese Americans. The original purpose of the El Centro camp was to be an administrative holding center for unauthorized Mexican migrants, many of whom had been working on local farms and ranches. The camp was intended to be a temporary facility, temporarily housing migrants until they could be deported to Mexico. From the beginning, the detainees were forced to work both on the detention camp itself and on the projects throughout the Imperial Valley. And in practice, migrants were often detained for longer than 30 days, while they served as the unpaid labor force of the center. Instead of closing, after the three months it was originally designed to be open, the camp remained open and expanded in 1948 to triple the capacity. Between the 1950s and the 1970s, the detention and deportation regime expanded as American immigration agents increased the policing of Mexican migrants along the U.S.-Mexico border. The El Centro Immigration Detention Camp was expanded again between 1971 and 1973 to house 632 migrants across four dormitories, and it was transformed into a service processing center in 1974. Even with the new construction, conditions were poor, as was reported in the Mexican press. Chicano activists referred to the El Centro facility as a concentration camp, where, quote, prisoners were kept for months with no regard for their legal rights, unquote. In 1985, conditions were so bad that the incarcerated migrants which by that time was a diverse group from many different countries, including one-third from El Salvador, decided to strike. This wasn't the first hunger strike at the facility, but it was the largest in the facility's history. On May 27, 1985, 15 detained men stormed the mess hall, inspiring somewhere between 175 and 300 more men to join them. The group refused to work, to go inside or to eat until their grievances were met. These grievances had been worked out in advance. Eighty-four prisoners signed a letter sent to attorney Graciela Zavala to inform her that they had attempted to report mistreatment to Immigration and Naturalization Services, INS, but after being ignored for months, they felt it was time to act. The strikers' complaints were, 1. The guards created an inhumane environment, including forcing the incarcerated migrants to stay outside all day in the heat of the Imperial Valley, which reached up to 120 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer. 2. The food was poor quality and insufficient, consisting of things like powdered eggs, beans, and Kool-Aid, and incarcerated migrants often had to line up in the sun two hours early to be sure they got food before it ran out. Three, they received poor medical treatment or had their medical concerns ignored completely. Four, there was no entertainment in the facility. A small outdoor recreational area was poorly maintained, and they had no access to television or radio or even to a library, despite the fact that they were responsible for their own legal cases. Since they were held on civil grounds, they were not entitled to legal counsel. And finally, five, the incarcerated migrants complained of physical abuse, 
psychological intimidation, solitary confinement, and threats of violence. On May 29th, two days into the strike, four strikers met with Robert C. Rolls, the facility's acting supervisor. He concluded that INS could do nothing about the demands and refused to take responsibility for the guards' actions. At 6 a.m. on May 31st, the El Centro Tactical Intervention and Control Unit, a local component of the Border Patrol Tactical Unit, entered the demonstration site in full riot gear and forcibly relocated the strikers indoors, dragging them, kicking them, and handcuffing them. By June 1st, there were only eight strikers from six different countries remaining. On June 3rd, the strike ended when a local Lutheran pastor, William Kosky, who was involved with the Imperial Valley Immigration Project, used his life savings to bail out the remaining strikers, shortly before guards would have attempted to force-feed them. The U.S. Attorney General presented a plaque to the immigration officials at El Centro for putting down the hunger strike quickly. The strikers themselves were isolated, cut off from legal counsel, and transferred to other facilities. A congressional delegation visited the facility and found overcrowding and inhumane conditions. Although the INS commissioner disagreed with the allegations, INS officials did begin allowing migrants inside during the day, and a library was open, funded in large part by the Mexican government. In 1987, INS issued its Detention Officer Handbook, which emphasized that detention was not punishment, but rather intended to, quote, ensure the alien's availability for deportation proceedings or expulsion, unquote. And yet, reports from incarcerated migrants at the facility demonstrated that rampant violence and inhumane treatment by guards continued. In September 2014, the El Centro Immigration Detention Center closed because of the high cost of running the outdated facility, despite workers' protests about losing their jobs. A new center, the Imperial Regional Detention Facility, run by prison contractor Management and Training Corporation, MTC, opened 17 miles to the southeast in Calesio. The new facility was specifically designed so that fewer guards are needed for the population, thus saving money. To help us understand more about the history of the El Centro Detention Facility, I am speaking now with Jessica Ordaz, Assistant Professor of Ethnic Studies at the University of Colorado Boulder, and author of the 2021 book, The Shadow of El Centro, Migrant Incarceration and Solidarity which was the major source for this introduction. Hi, Jessica. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, so this book is uh, really terrific. It's uh, a hard read emotionally, but uh, I learned a lot. So I I wanted to start by asking you just, you know, what, what inspired you to write about migrant detention and El Centro? You know, I, this has come up in the news more recently. Of course, during the Trump administration, there was a lot of talk about family separation at the border. And during COVID crisis, there's talk about overcrowding and things. But, you know, it seems like prior to that, of course, there were scholars talking about it and stuff, but it wasn't something that the the general public was thinking a whole lot about. So what brought you to this research? Yeah, that's a terrific question. So before I developed an intellectual interest in my incarceration, I had personal experiences with it that made it so that it was constantly on my mind. I am the daughter of migrants who came to the United States in the 1980s from Michoacan, Mexico. And so my own father, for a period of time, was apprehended, detained, and deported. And just in my larger uh, family, there definitely was social impacts when it came to the detention and deportation regime. And so having grown up with those experiences made it so that 
migrant incarceration was at the forefront of my mind. And when I entered the PhD program at UC Davis, I realized I wanted to explore this intellectually. So those two things really coalesced and became the start of this project. One of the things that you talk about in the book uh, is the sort of difficulty of uh, sources in a, a project like this in these places that are, you know, meant to be at some points actually temporary structures, but always meant to be theoretically at least temporary places for people to be. These people are moving on, you know, that the, the archival sources can be difficult to obtain. So can you talk some about what what that meant for you, what that project looked like, finding the sources you need, what sort of sources you were using, uh, and just sort of take us through that. Yeah, and this is a great question, considering that I'm currently calling in from Mexico City, working on a second project, um, which maybe we can circle back to. But it reminded me, because I hadn't been here in a few years, of those difficulties when I was doing research for the, the project on El Centro, which is that I had a lot of hopes. I really hoped to find a lot of migrants who had been specifically incarcerated in the El Centro immigration facility. And I hoped for like oral history to make up a big part of the project. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way which makes sense. Like you said, this is a very heavy topic. It was difficult to have people come forward and to disclose that, you know, per perhaps they're still undocumented or they had been deported. There's a lot of shame associated with that. So for those reasons, I didn't end up with a big pool of folks who wanted to be interviewed, who had been incarcerated in El Centro. So what I ended up doing was really following the archival trail, which took me to places like Washington, D.C., like New Mexico, and definitely all throughout California. And in addition to that, I did interview quite a bit of lawyers and immigration rights activists to really try to flesh out um, the narrative that I tell in the book. But it ended up um, definitely shifting as I moved forward in, in the research process because I, I was asking people very difficult you know, difficult questions and asking them to recall their diff difficult times. It was hard for me as a scholar to write about the horrors of detention centers. And so, of course, for people who have experienced this in their life, it was even that much harder. So I did have one person who I found in Los Angeles who had been incarcerated in that facility in the 1980s. And his story was super helpful um, and just sort of validated a lot of what I had already found in the archive. And so his story is documented in the chapter about uh, transnational migrant politics. So that was a little bit of, of my journey. Yeah, you just mentioned how hard this is as a scholar. I, I wanted to ask about that too. It's, you know, this is as I mentioned, it's it's difficult subject matter. Uh, you know, as I was reading it, of course, I could put it down if it got to be too much, and then pick it up again. You know, what does that look like as a scholar trying to to tell this really important story? Um, but you know, it it has to have an effect on you as well as you as you hear about these horrors about what's happening. Absolutely, it was very challenging um, in ways that I guessed, but not to like the degree, right? Like the degree um, of how challenging it was. And I could have perhaps taken more breaks, but instead what I did is I sort of tried to push through and wrap up the project a bit sooner than I would have otherwise. And so it's a shorter book for that same reason. I, I felt like it's short, but it's very heavy. And there was not necessarily a need to sort of have, you know, five more chapters on how violent detention centers are. I think I get that message across um, with what I have written. And so my tactic was to wrap up the project sooner rather than later. There were days where I would definitely need, like I needed to step away um, myself from writing. And so that made it particularly challenging. And I just really had to prioritize self-care um, always, but especially 
when not even the writing, but more like the close reading of the sources, because they were all negative, um, even in moments where I, I talk about, write about, and was reading about resistance, the context is still migrant incarceration. And so I just had to be very cognizant of um, how I was feeling and how much I could handle any one day with the project. Yeah, so you mentioned a, a little bit ago the uh, the transnational migrant politics chapter, and so this is the same chapter that you're talking about the hunger strike at El Centro in 1985. So I, I wondered if we could unpack that uh, story a little bit. So first, I guess just uh, for listeners, what does uh, transnational migrant politics mean? Yeah, so I came to this term to really highlight the fact that migrants who are incarcerated in any part of the carceral state come with their own lineages and legacies of resistance, of protest, of politics, etc. And I came to that, which might sound obvious, but I came to that because in 1985, INS officials constantly said, you know, that these hunger strikes were um, manipulated and planned by lawyers and not folks who were actually incarcerated. So not seeing them as active agents with their own um, struggles and ideologies. And I really wanted to highlight that because they're migrants, they're coming from, you know, places that have their own histories and strategies of resistance that then they utilize once they're incarcerated in the United States. Importantly, of course, in this uh, story, what is happening in 1985 is that unlike the population of El Centro going into this, uh, which had been largely Mexican, although not exclusively, that suddenly in the mid-80s, there are all these uh, migrants from El Salvador, from uh, parts of Central America with a lot of violence. Can you talk a little bit about that history, why that happens, uh, and what that means, what sort of situation they are coming from? Yeah, so the irony is that they end up in U.S. federal operated detention facilities where they're filing for asylum. And at the time, only about 2% of folks, especially from El Salvador, will gain political asylum. So most of them deported to their own deaths from places they're fleeing. And the irony is that, you know, they're fleeing, they're fleeing the consequences of empire and a, and a big part of it is the U.S. empire in particular, which is why I say it's ironic they're causing these crises themselves. And so there's a lot of political turmoil throughout Latin America, but in particular Central America, there's a lot of revolution and counter-revolution and coups, and this causes violence and war and unstable economies, all reasons why the Central Americans migrate to the United States during the end of the 1970s and 1980s. And so you see this the shift that you talked about demographically in El Centro, where for decades, most of the migrants were coming from Mexico. And then because of this increase in Central American migration caused by, in large part, U.S. empire, um, those dynamics and demographics changed. And so, for example, um, in the 1980s, people from El Salvador in particular make up a majority of the men that are held at the El Centro facility. This resistance, and you, you talk in the book about several different kinds of resistance that happen uh, really from the very beginning of this facility, uh, people trying to run away, hunger strikes, you know, lots of different forms of resistance. Uh, but, you know, what what is the evidence of this, that, that these acts of resistance are happening. What does that tell us about what the conditions are like? You know, you talk some about uh, this, this sense almost of, of haunting and ghosts, like, you know, you, know, you have to find uh, the, the story, what's happening uh, in part by, by looking around it. So, you know, what, what do we know about what must have been happening in the center, even if you didn't get to talk to everyone who was there 
that leads to these kinds of acts of resistance like this hunger strike? Yeah, or running away. So in terms of escape, I think what is really telling is in terms of labor. So I write at the beginning of the book about the use of incarcerated migrants, not only to work within the facility, but to actually be driven out throughout the Imperial Valley and work in construction projects, as well as literally the backyards of different immigration officials. And so this is around the 1940s. And from the very start, from the very like day one that the facility or at this time the camp is in operation, people are escaping and fleeing, which is not surprising, right? When someone's incarcerated, it's against their will. And so it makes sense that people would want to flee. However, what I find interesting is that the immigration officials termed the use of their labor as voluntary, right? Like they used them as literally legally a voluntary workforce and they had voluntary work parties. But in fact, what I argue is that we see in the archive stories of Mexican migrant men literally escaping at every opportunity that they get, including when they're on these supposed work parties. So it really puts into question the voluntary nature, so much so that I call it a form of forced labor, right? They're literally escaping not only the poor conditions within the camp, but the the extraction of their labor. And so I think that that's something that that example of resistance reveals. Yeah, it was interesting that in the 1985 hunger strike that uh, they actually had a list of demands. Uh, So they, they go through a lawyer, they try to give the demands directly to officials and get nowhere uh, and have these very specific demands uh, that, of course, aren't met immediately because the the hunger strike is put down forcibly. Uh, But it sounds like, uh, although things, of course, did not (laughs) become perfect by a very long stretch, that some of these things actually were then maybe taken into consideration, that some of these demands were slowly over time met in at least small ways. Yeah, the most important one I would think for the men who participated in that hunger strike was that, you know, for folks who, listeners who are not familiar with the geography of Southern California, El Centro is located in the Imperial Valley and it is in the summer very, very hot and like up to 110, 115. So in 1985, the men who protested were not allowed to be indoors during the day at peak hot hours. They had to like queue outside basically. And so one of their demands was to be let inside and they did gain that, which, you know, I I, I say that it's complicated and that ultimately a lot of things stayed the same and a lot of things got worse. And we can discuss that a little bit further, but for those particular men, that was huge, right? To go from having to stand outside for, five plus hours in 115 degree weather to be let in indoors where it was uh, cooler. uh, That was a a very big win for them. Yeah, definitely. Can you expand a little bit on that? Uh, The, the types of things like that, that did get a little bit better, but, but things that actually got worse afterward as well. Right. So I think that surveillance actually gets worse so much. So, that the El Centro Immigration Facility closes in 2014. And I say closes very loosely. What ICE then did was close down the facility and reopen one in Mexico down the road. And this one is fully privatized. It's co-ed. And a big difference is actually they now have less guards than they had in El Centro for many decades. And the rationale, according to a few immigration attorneys who I interviewed who work out of the Imperial Regional Facility, the one in Calexico, they said that the idea is that they built the facility in a very um, intentional way so that they wouldn't have to hire as many guards and can just rely on the architecture of the center for surveillance and to keep uh, detained migrants in pods. And so that's, that's an example, right, of how 
immigration authorities have really thought through from 1945 when this camp in El Centro is very small, it's makeshift, the fence is wire mesh and people are literally escaping by digging under and jumping above to like 2021 where you now have this new facility down the road that is built in such a way that you don't even need to have a lot of guards because the very structure of the facility ensures that people are always watching. One of the things that uh, strikes you reading this and you sort of talk at the the beginning and then at the, again, at the end about that is when this facility closes in 2014, that the people who live in this area, in the Imperial Valley, are so they're so tied to their employment uh, being part of this facility that they're going to lose their jobs. That they're not thinking the way that you writing this are thinking the way that I reading this. I'm thinking about the cruelty of the center. You know, they're thinking we're going to lose our jobs. There seems to be such a a disconnect. There is that part of sort of the 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 system as it's built like the the whole carceral system uh, throughout this country you know do you see a, a connection there yes and i actually have a really great example from when i first started the research i was able to do i was able to take a tour of the el centro facility before it closed in 2014 and there was a latina ice agent who who gave me that tour? And I remember asking her questions like, when did this facility open? Or, you know, like, how does this work? Or how is it operated? And it just reminded me, I think, with a lot of institutions that employees, workers, laborers are often doing like a small part of the work of the entire system. So she actually didn't know how to answer any of those questions. And she seemed genuinely interested. Like, I don't know, you know, why we do X or Y or Z. But when I mentioned that there had been a hunger strike, for instance, in 1985, she's like, oh, actually, that makes sense. Because in our like, when we do trainings, they talk about like hunger strikes and how to like, you know, make sure we smash them down as quickly as possible and things like that. So I kind of interpreted her general lack of information about what was going on in the facility is like very intentional from like a systematic sense, right? Like it works in the system's benefit so that employees are doing a small part of the repression so that they're not getting the full picture, right? Like I'm sure if this one ICE agent read the book, she would probably be surprised by a lot of what's in there because she doesn't necessarily know that history. And that's intentional and by design, I believe. Mm, yeah. I want to ask about this idea of deportation. So it seems like a lot of what is done in uh, in these facilities is to try to convince people to self-deport, that instead of waiting around to, to uh, see if their asylum claim goes through, that they should just go back where they came from. And uh, you talk some in the book about what that actually looks like when they actually are deported, where they go to, what happens to them. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and why that is a choice that people would not want to make, even in the face of these horrible conditions in these centers, that they don't want to go back, don't want to be deported. Yeah, uh, historically and even today, like people flee for very many different reasons, not always war and violence. But if we're talking about the Americas, at least um, in the last few decades, that is very much the case, right? And so I do talk a little bit about the 1980s and number of folks from El Salvador who were deported and then like literally like would be decapitated and murdered. Um, And so a lot of them are fleeing literally death threats. And so even though they're experiencing very violent conditions in the detention center, I think the idea that they might be able to get asylum or might be able to stay in the United States is like this hope that they hold on to. Whereas if they're deported and it, it is the case where they, their lives have already been threatened, like they know what they're going back to. And so there's this sense of like, well, maybe 
you know, this might be worth it if I can get asylum, if I can stay in the United States, which is the goal. Um, But unfortunately, that rarely happens. Yeah, and I I was so horrified to read about uh, the idea of deporting people back, yes, maybe to a country that they know, but to a city they don't know at all, or they need to walk very far to get anywhere where there's even civilization with maybe no money, with, with no resources, with no connections in this place. You know, I think that was something that had never occurred to me, like what what being deported actually meant. Yeah. So is there anything else that you want to make sure that we talk about? I guess I will just say that I think an important part of what I try to untangle are the functions of migrant incarceration. And so a lot of scholars have started to write about the rise and like, how did we get, you know, from detaining a couple thousand people across the country to the hundreds of thousands of people we now detain, which I think is a super important question. And I, I address it a bit, but really what I think I was interested in understanding and grappling with is like, what is the function? Like, who does this benefit? Why do we have this detention and deportation system that is utterly violent? And in the case of my book, I've charted how decade after decade after decade, you know, I I'm personally don't believe in reforming the, the system because I was able to trace that violence and it doesn't diminish. (laughs) If anything, the system just becomes smarter, right? And like in the example of surveillance, they respond to the resistance of migrants and they become more repressive and, and more quick to smash any type of dissent. And so I really want to leave listeners and and readers of the book um, with that question and for people to grapple that with them, like amongst themselves, like what is really the function? Like, how is this useful in any way? Can you tell me uh, a little bit about your new project and will it be at all uh, more emotionally um, or (laughs) less emotionally difficult perhaps? Yes. So I'm actually, like I mentioned earlier, in Mexico City doing some of the preliminary research on my second project, which is about intersectional veganism and the long history of plant-based foods in the Americas. And so, yes, I, I think it will be lighter emotionally, but not not without its own challenges. And of course, I'm still interrogating things like capitalism and colonization and um, cruelty against animals. So there's definitely still a thread there of of violence. But I already feel, even just in the preliminary research, that it is not as heavy as as my first project was. Yeah, well, I I am excited uh, to read that a few years down the road. And uh, in the meantime, I will put a link to The Shadow of El Centro in the show notes, uh, and I really do encourage people to read it. I think it is, you know, while a difficult read emotionally, of course, it is so important, and uh, I really learned a lot. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks for listening to Unsung History. You can find the sources used for this episode at unsunghistorypodcast.com. To the best of our knowledge, all audio and images used by Unsung History are in the public domain or are used with permission. You can find us on Twitter or Instagram at unsung underscore underscore history or on Facebook at Unsung History Podcast. To contact us with questions or episode suggestions, please email kelly at unsunghistorypodcast.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate and review and tell your friends.